So I started diving very early in life. Uh, it was my way to explore the underwater world that always fascinated me. So I became a marine biologist to better understand it. Photography came a little bit later, and it was, uh, I found out very soon that it was an extremely powerful tool so that, that I can, so I can share with the others the wonderful things that we're seeing on the water, but also the threats the marine ecosystems are facing today. Okay. So one of my first, first photos was taken about 15 years ago while I was working um, on a marine species book for uh, Berlingas Marine Reserve, which is a, a marine protected area about 60 miles uh, north of Lisbon. So I, I took a photo of this, and I had no idea what it was. I sent this photo to um, a few colleagues, taxonomists, and they identified it as an anemone. So it's not the typical anemone that we are used to see, usually that lives attached to the rocks with the tentacles. It's just a different one. But the curious thing about this animal is that it was a typically from, from tropical regions. And, I was, and this represented the northernmost record for this species to date. Now, if you dive in the same place today, you can easily see three or four of these animals in one dive alone. And the same is true for different species of fishes, of uh, algae, corals. So there's a clear sign of um, global warming, and that's how photography can also help uh, in, in science. Now, this photo it was taken in the, in the Cape Verde Islands back in 2017. So um, I've chosen this photo because it represents um, a, a major threat for marine um, ecosystems today, and it, that's ghost fishing. Ghost fishing can be defined as any uh, fishing device that is lost or discarded and that keeps fishing forever and killing marine life. So these two puffer fish were stuck inside this trap, unable to come out, and they, they would eventually have died if they had not been released and the trap brought to shore to prevent any more mortalities. Now, from the same trip, um, and, and uh, again, uh, we're talking about ghost fishing. Now, sadly, not all animals are so lucky. This is a juvenile green sea turtle, um, and the, the locals in Cape Verde Islands, they, they, they named it, this, this animal in particular, Margarida. So Margarida was living in a sheltered bay um, near uh, Mindelo, the, the, the city where most of the dive centers are located. And uh, this was uh, great for the, dive, for, the, for the dive centers there because it, it was so close to the city. And the, usually the, the divers, the clients, are always keen to see these iconic animals. Um, so the, the, this, the fact that Margarida was... Uh, living in this sheltered bay nearby was saving them a lot of money on fuel because they would have, before this, before they get established there, they would have to travel three times the same distance to take clients to see turtles. So as I was uh, diving in and photographing Margarida, I was realizing the impact that one single live animal can have in a small business, such as a dive center, especially in a, in a, in a uh, relatively poor place like Cape Verde. Now, three months later, I was back in Portugal, and I received a phone call of a friend. He was working in one of these dive centers, telling me that Bergadil was found dead, entangled in a, in a, in a fishing net that was, was, was lost. So this is the problematic of, of ghost fishing, not just ecological, but also commercial. Now, on a more positive note, on, uh, on, on, on turtles, this is a, a different species. This is a loggerhead and it was taken in Fayal in the Azores uh, two, two or three years ago. Um, loggerheads, this species, is, are, well, juveniles and subadults particularly are relatively common in the Northeast Atlantic. And 95% of the, of the Atlantic population of the loggerheads are born in Florida. So right after hatching, these little sea turtles, not more than five to 10 centimeters, they, they embark in the biggest journey of their life. They basically rush to the ocean, and benefiting from the Gulf Stream, they end up in the, in the, in the, uh, in, in the Northeast Atlantic, so uh, around the Madeira Islands, uh, the Azores, and the Canaries, where they live a big part of their life before eventually, at some point, return back to Florida. Now, as you can imagine, uh, for such a small turtle that just recently uh, was born, this trip can be extremely challenging, and many of them get reached to, the, to, the, to this side, to the Azores, um, injured, dehydrated, uh, malnourished, and many of them don't even make it. Now, thanks to uh, a group of organizations working together, it was possible to create a rescue and rehab program, rehabilitation program. 
So many times it is possible to save these animals and once they're fully recovered, put them back in the ocean. Now researchers from the local university in the Azores realized that this is an amazing opportunity to study these animals and to better understand their movements and their migratory routes and, and their ecology. This is absolutely critical information for conservation. As you can see, this small little turtle, it's probably difficult to see, but it's got a little thing on the carapace, which is a solar power tag that basically gives them information about the movements of the turtle so they can better uh, track, the, track them. Now, speaking of long migrations, um, this is one of the three species of mobulate arrays, or manta arrays, as you want to call them, uh, in, in, in Portugal, in Portuguese waters. We have three species of, of mobulate arrays. And this photo was taken in, in the Azores, in, particularly in the island of Santa Maria. Now, this is a, an endangered species and has been the focus of research for scientists for quite some years now. They're trying to better understand their ecology in order to suggest, suggest strategies to better protect them. Now, this is a relatively common scenario on the top of two sea mounts in the Azores, particularly the Princess Alice in Ambrosio. Um, uh, this one was taken in Ambrosio, so off Santa Maria Island um, in 2018. Um, and this, this, these guys, basically, they, they get to, 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 to the Azores, to the sea mounts, uh, in the beginning of the summer, and they usually stay until late September. So this is a an amazing opportunity for scientists to study these, these typically oceanic animals because they basically know they're going to stick around for the whole summer. So it's a, 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 a great opportunity to better understand their uh, life habits and their, and their, and their movements. Uh, so I had an opportunity to be there uh, back in 2018 um, with Anna Filipe Sobral. Anna, please raise your arm. She's right there and uh, she's about to, to defend her PhD uh, in manta rays and, and mobile rays in the Northeast Atlantic. And we were together back in 2018. That's an flip right there. And as you can see there, she's holding a pole in, in her hand. That's actually a biopsy pole that she uses to collect tissue samples from these animals. Basically, it's just a little pinch in, 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 in these animals to collect tissue from the epiderm uh, uh, of, of, of the species so she can use in genetic studies and better understand population structure. Now, one of the first things uh, Anna asked me when I got to the Azores was to photograph the belly of the, of, of the mobile rays in the water. So this is one of the, 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 the photos that I did um, back then. And, uh, and this is very interesting. So thanks to a, a tool called photo identification uh, and thanks to a software, specific software that Anna uses, uh, this software can recognize all that gray pattern that you can see in the end of the, well, near, near the posterior end of, of the manta ray. That gray pattern is unique for each animal. So basically, it works like a fingerprint. So uh, Anna created this uh, amazing tool, which is the Manta Catalog Project. And you can search online, or you can uh, ask Anna more details about this. But basically, it's a citizen science program. So any diver that goes in the water and finds mobile arrays can Take a, take, a, take a photo and upload this photo into Manta Catalog Project and eventually see if there's a match or if it's a new animal. So by creating this uh, network uh, from divers from all over the world, uh, it is possible to better understand this, um, this, this, this species' migration routes, habitats, and ecology. So it, this will make uh, scientists a lot easier, uh, the job a lot, lot easier in order to create conservation um, initiatives. Now I've chosen this image as it represents one of the main threats that sharks face nowadays, and I'm sure you all know about this. We're talking about shark finning, so the, 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 the act of removing the fins from sharks, uh, mostly to, sh to sell uh, for shark fin soup, especially in the Asian market. Now, the, 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 the act of um, well, shark finning can be an, extremely cruel. It's basically uh, they remove the, the fins from the shark's body and uh, quite often discard the body, often with, where these animals are still alive. Now, these animals, unable to, to swim because they have no fins, basically sim, swim, sink down to the bottom. Uh, and most of the sharks, most of the species of sharks, need to be constantly swimming to oxygenate their gills and their, their, to breathe. 
Um, so unable to swim, these animals sink on the bottom of the seafloor and they will die of suffocation. Now we're talking about an apex predator with a critical role in the ecosystem balance. So removing these animals can have uh, dramatic effects and consequences and we're now starting to experience the, the, this fact. Now, particularly in the islands of Pico and Fayal in the Azores, um, besides the ecologically important, important importance of sharks, particularly of blue shark, which, are, which is probably the most common um, species occurring in these waters, they also have a, a very important commercial uh, um, role, particularly in the diving market. So there's divers coming from all over the world to dive with these sharks in the clear blue waters of the Azores. So um, in a small place like Pico and Fayal, divers coming from all over the world for the whole summer or sometimes more can have a great impact in the local economy. And it, it is, this is the, the proof that sharks worth much more alive than that. Now, curious thing, these animals are not shy at all and they often approach divers and they come to inspect us. Uh, they don't harm you, but they, they come to inspect you. Now, this fact led local researchers in the Azores to develop a very interesting um, technique to study their movements. Um, while free diving, researchers, uh, as you can see there, use this, um, they're trying, trying to implement this tag, with the electronic tag, to, uh, in, on the shark, uh, that this tag would, will collect a lot of information uh, about the shark movements, but also velocity, temperature, depth, and this is, again, critical information to better know the species and to better be able to protect it. Now, basically what happens is that the, the, what, what the diver is holding, the free diver is holding, is an harness that is connected to the tag, the electronic tag, and what it does, it basically passes the harness through the shark's head and it will lodge right before the pectoral fins, as you can see here. Now, the revolutionary part about this, this project and about this method is that this harness has got a, a galvanic ring that once in, in contact with salt water starts dissolving. And between 24 to 48 hours, it will be completely dissolved and the harness will open and the whole device will come back to the surface, float back to the surface uh, and will send a signal which will allow researchers to recover it and download the data and understand where this shark has been um, moving around and all the information that I've mentioned that that tag is able to, to get. Now, while, while in the Azores, it's impossible not to mention some of the giants that occur there. So, sperm whales are a symbol of the Azores. Whale hunting um, happened until 1986 when it was prohibited. And since then, um, the, the, basically, the whale hunting was replaced by whale watching. Now, you see, uh, every year, thousands of tourists fly to the Azores to be able to see these amazing animals, not just sperm whales, but about 30 species of marine mammals that occur in these waters, especially in, in between April and June. So, uh, you, of course, need a, a special permit to dive and photograph these animals from the regional government. Um, but um, the Azores is now considered a sanctuary for these animals. They're a symbol of the Azores, as I said. And uh, it is possible now to start seeing the effects of protecting these animals and to conserve these animals in images like this. And of course, while we're, while, while we're talking about giants in, in, in the Azores, it's impossible not to mention the whale shark. So the biggest fish in the ocean is also present in the Azores. Most of the community, diving community, and even the scientific community, didn't know about this until about a decade ago. And this was quite surprising. Once this, once, once this well, divers and the researchers started talking to local fishermen, to local community, uh, and they, they realized that actually the species had been there for longer than everyone thought. But just, they just named it a different thing. They called it pintado, which kind of translates to spotted, because of the spots, of course. So, Basically, what I'm trying to say here is that scientific knowledge is absolutely crucial for development, but popular and empirical knowledge must not be left apart along the way. 
Now, this photo was taken in one of the most successful marine protected areas in, in Portugal, also one of the most remote, remote places, and that obviously cannot be disconnected. This was taken in Formigas, uh, which is a very small uh, group of uh, rocks, basically, um, off uh, San Miguel in Santa Maria Islands. Um, now, in, 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 um, in Formigas, there's one particular spot that is called the, the grouper's wall, Parede dos Medos. And here you can see something what it, that is quite unique in Portuguese waters. Dozens of these animals, the, the dusky groupers, uh, it's an endangered species. And nowadays, it's relatively difficult to see them except inside marine protected areas. Now, diving in, in the, 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 dusky, the, the, the dusky wall, dusky grouper's wall, grouper's wall um, it's like a trip to the past. A, a, a past when these animals were not affected by human pressure and were not, and were not fished beyond the sustainable limits, which, ha which happens today and it has been happening for the last decades. Now, here these animals can live and thrive, showing us how efficient marine protected areas can be, and that's why they're so important. Now, I think the message is clear. The ocean is resilient, but we must do our part if we want future generations to be able to see dusky groupers, blue sharks, manta rays, loggerhead sea turtles, and not just in photos. Thank you. <laughs>